back in the 80s, I believe it was, that I saw this book that said, Good Morning, Lord. And uh, I bought that book, and come to find out it was a man by the name of George Sheehan. George Sheehan uh, was the man, he's a, he's a millionaire, very wealthy man, but he, Bible college I went to, he supported preachers, and he, and he donated lots of money to the college there. And I found out that uh, every morning, every morning, he opened his window and said, Good morning, Lord. Hmm. Nothing like that, is it? Hmm. Just to address the Heavenly Father. And he brought the Charlotte Hornets in to Charlotte, and then I think they went to uh, Louisiana, New Orleans or something since then. But he's a very good Christian man. Anyway, we're glad you're here. We appreciate those who visit with us. Uh, this is the 63rd uh, homecoming of uh, Hillcrest. Do we have any uh, founder members here? Who, 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 who are the founders? Anybody hold up your hand, anyone? Okay, we've got some here. Oh, we've got several founder members. Well, God bless you, and you're still here, and praise the Lord for that. And uh, we're just glad you're here, and appreciate our visitors. And I'll, I'll introduce Gabe just in a few moments. But, but you, anybody have been to the Comedy Barn? That is a fun place to go, right? <laughs> I never laughed so much in my life at them crazy people. That, it's a good Christian place, you know. You don't find many anymore. But I went up there and I saw these guys. I'll tell you, Mitzi, she just lost it up there a few times, you know. <laughs> It's so funny, and, and, and it was unbelievable the talent that these people have to do what they do. So anyway, I'm endorsing them. It's a good place to go. Enjoyed it immensely. Uh, now, no service tonight, but we're going to have a wonderful meal over here in the Fellowship Homes. Brother Earl, Earl said, you're going to see a different building over to what it used to be. It's just a beautiful place. And we, I, say, I say again for the trustees and all the other volunteers that's worked on that building, thank you for what you've done. It's been a beautiful job. And I guarantee you, you guys won't go away from here hungry. If you do, it ain't these people's fault. There'll be plenty to eat, and we're glad you're here. And we just appreciate you visiting with us. I, 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 don't, I don't think I see anybody that's not been here before. I, I, I know Gabe, did you come? Did Amber come the other time you were here? Okay, so, so really they've been here before. But anyway, we're delighted, and I'm going to let uh, Gabe come. But I don't know of anybody. Let me say this before I do. Now, I'm not endorsing no candidate, but you all need to vote for Tuesday, okay? That is our God-given right to do, and I encourage everybody to do that. Just vote, and so don't forget that. Now, um, I, I don't know of anybody, any two people that uh, I love any better than these two. This, this boy, this man here, I, I'm down at Donson. I'm, I'm an old man, and, and he was a youth pastor, and uh, he said, why don't you come preach to my youth? Me preach to youth, you know? <laughs> and, uh, yeah, he said, and I got up there and found out he preaches like I do. He preached them just like I did preach anybody. And, and those youth, he had 70 youth in that class. And I want to tell you, him and Amber did a wonderful job. And when you go into the Dotson Church, you'll see all them youth lined up right in front down there and praising God and lifting their hands. And he did a fan, him and Amber did a wonderful job with those youth. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. And, I, and I begin to grow, and I guess six, seven years now that mm -hmm. Gabe and I have been friends. He's one of the finest pastor friends that I've got. And when we talk about it every week, sometimes two or three times a week. And he got associated with my Alabama son-in-law. I forgive him for that, but he went up to done a mission trip in Asheville uh, up there at a church that I used to pastor, and then a uh, uh, children's home in Asheville, and they did a wonderful mission trip up there. And hopefully this coming year we're going to join together with Providence, with our youth, uh, to go up to Asheville and do some kind of a mission trip up there. So hopefully we can get that worked out. So anyway, Gabe Brown, who is now the pastor of Providence Baptist Church, doing a wonderful job up there, him and Amber, and uh, 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 Kirsten, Kinsley, and uh, jo Joseph. I got it. These three <laughs> wonderful children. And so they're down in children's church. But anyway, uh, I, I guarantee you that God will bless uh, you by hearing Brother Gabe preach the Word of God because he, uh, he just loves God and he loves the Word of God. And, had the privilege of preaching up at his church and that revival and just had a wonderful time. And we just praise God for him coming, being able to come. And uh, so uh, we're just going to turn him loose and let him go. And I told him there's no restraints. Just preach what God laid on his heart, and he will. And so, Brother Gabe, you come at this time and just carry the service out as the Lord leads.
Love you, my brother. Love you. Amen. Well, amen. It is an honor being back with you here at Hillcrest again. I, I believe this is the third time I've had the honor and privilege of being able to come and share God's Word. So anytime you're asked back somewhere, that's a good thing. Amen. Uh, I know this also with it being a homecoming service, this is an important day of the year. So one of the biggest jobs I have, Brother Charles, is not messing it up. Amen. So I want to thank you, Hillcrest Baptist Church. Wonderful church, wonderful people. We had Brother Charles come. We had a revival here about a month ago, a little over a month ago actually. Had a wonderful lineup of preachers, Brother Charles being one of them. And I know you guys came and supported him. And that says a lot of you guys. So I want to let you all know how much I appreciate you, Hillcrest Baptist Church. I also want to let Brother Charles know he knows how much I appreciate him. As he said, we talk probably once, once a week at least. Uh, we call on Mondays, talk to one another. And he, with me being a young preacher, I kind of consider myself being similar to a Timothy and him. And I, I'm bragging on God and saying this. He, to me, he's like a Paul is to a young Timothy because that's what Paul did is he poured in to young Timothy. So I appreciate him, his willingness to sit down and talk to a young, dumb preacher like myself, because that's what I am. I barely graduated from William Blunt. Amen. But I made it. Made it. Got up to Maryville College. Graduated from there. But uh, I, I so love your pastor, and I'm so thankful for him. You are very blessed to have him here. If you would turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke chapter 15. You know, when Brother Charles talked to me about coming and preaching on this particular day, you're thinking, okay, homecoming, God, what would you have me to say? What message would you have me to bring? And this is where he led me. Luke chapter 15. A very familiar passage of Scripture. I know probably everyone in here who's been in church any amount of time has heard this parable preached, the parable of the prodigal son. However, I do believe that through this message today that God will reveal hopefully some new things to you as He has done for me. As I've studied this and preached this and listened to other people uh, discuss this topic, I've learned a lot of things. It's amazing how when you read something from God's perfect inerrant Word, amen. Let's go ahead and start right there. You all do know this is perfect, amen. This is a, hey, this is our source of truth. It's an Aaron, it's infallible. This is where we go with any of life's problems. This is where we start and this is where we stop. Yeah. Just in case you were wondering, anything that I say is going to be, the best that I know how is going to be from this source of truth. Yeah. That's so important in today's times to realize where do you get your answers from. I see on TV all the time, there's, there's polls. And they'll say, what do you think about this? And then they'll show a statistic from the 1940s or 1950s, and then they'll show what people think now. And those polls change. But you know what? God's Word never does. You see, that's called relative truth. Relative truth changes. Relative truth is when people lick their finger and put it up in the air and see how the wind's blowing and they go with the crowd, where absolute truth never changes. Jesus never changes, nor does His Word. So I'm thankful for that. And that's what we're going to be looking at today in Luke chapter 15. Let's look at the first three verses. Now let me say this. I was talking with Brother Charles earlier this week and I said, you know, I believe when people preach on this parable, the first three verses are neglected many times. And to understand this parable, you must understand these first three verses so let's read it together. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. Verse 2, And the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. Verse 3, And he spake this parable unto them, saying, Father, Lord, help us. Use this time today, Lord, what an honor it is to be in your house, Lord, I feel the presence of the Spirit. I pray that the folks here know there's liberty and freedom to come up. There will be deacons. Uh, their very pastor will meet them at this altar, Lord. They don't have to wait for the invitation. They can come now. They can come in the middle of the service. Lord, I was saved in the middle of a service. 
So Lord, I pray the people know they have that liberty here today. I know I have the liberty to preach and I'm thankful for it. So Lord, work in a mighty way. Use this time to glorify and magnify Yourself. Lord, if we're here for any other reason, we're wasting time. So we lift You up now, we thank You, and it's in Your Son's holy and precious name we do pray. Amen. Amen. You see here at the first of this chapter in Luke chapter 15, uh, a scenario. Let me, let me paint the picture for you. Jesus is hanging around. The Bible says, and that's important, that's, where we get, that's our source of truth. I want to continue to remind you of that. He's hanging out with sinners. He's talking with them. He's interacting with them. And here comes a group of self-righteous Pharisees. And they look over and they see Jesus talking to these sinners. And what's the Bible say they start do? They start murmuring amongst themselves. And I know, listen, I know that never happens here in the church, right? You never, you're never going to encounter people murmuring in the church. I hope you can sense my sarcasm there. But there, there's murmuring, there's, there's talking, there's whispering about Jesus, the one who's been manifested in the flesh. He's 100% God. He's 100% man. He's omniscient. He knows what they're talking about. He knows. He senses what's going on. And then it says that in verse 3, and he spake this parable unto them, saying. Now, he shares three parables parable of the lost coin, parable of the lost sheep, and then the parable of the prodigal son. We, we're going to focus on the third parable today. But he shares three parables, and the three parables. And by the way, let's, let's define what a parable is. It's so important in today's times. Again, we talk about what our source of truth is. It's important to define terms. A parable is a, uh, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. That's what I love about Jesus as a teacher. When you look at His parables, He meets people where they are. He uses illustrations and applications that the people can relate to. Uh, the children of Israel were an agricultural people. Now look at his parable. So many of them are about farming. We live in a, we live in a country, right? We live in the mountains. I, I love living here. I've lived here my whole life. I go up north somewhere and I ask somebody for a, a, a Coke and they say a pop. And I'm like, no, I'm, I'm talking about a Coke. All right? Uh, I go out west and I'm trying to order some biscuits and gravy. And they say, we don't serve biscuits and gravy out here. I'm like, well, sit, ship me back to Tennessee where we can have some biscuits and gravy. I better stop talking about food here because I know we got some waiting on us over here. But anyway, we see them talking to, uh, about Jesus and He speaks up and He knows, he, he tells these three parables. Now let's fast forward down in our text to verse 11. And this is, we have bypassed the first two parables and look at verse 11 with me and he said a certain man had two sons and the younger of them said to his father father give me the portion of goods that falleth to me and he divided unto them his living and not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there were wasted his substance with riotous living when he had spent all there, arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields and to feed the swine. And he would fain, verse 16, have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he, look here, verse 17, there's a light bulb moment for him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. Let's, let's, let's discuss what's gone on here. You have a son, and by the way, let me say this before I even get into that. I always heard this preached as a young man when I got saved growing up, I always heard the parable of the prodigal son preached in a context of a backslidden Christian. I've always heard it that way. I'm going to challenge you today. 
I'm here to tell you right now that that one son that left was lost. And I'm going to explain to you why. Because I respect many of the men who have preached the text in that way. But I'm going to explain to you why I believe that that one son was lost. There's actually two sons, but I'm going to explain the one son's circumstances. You see, he goes to his father and he asks for his inheritance. Now in that culture, a, a precious lady up here a moment ago was talking about the martyrs. And she was talking about how across the world there are people that are being martyred for the sake of the gospel. She's absolutely correct. I've got a brother that lives in London. And he's had the opportunity to lead Muslims to Christ. And those Muslims go back into their community and listen, they are cut off. And sometimes they're beaten, sometimes they're killed. It's unfortunate, but that's the world we live in. Obviously, the prince of the power of the air does not want the gospel to be spread. Amen? Uh, Satan does not want God's Word to, to spread. It's no wonder people don't want prayer in schools and Scripture in schools uh, because that's not what Satan is the ruler. He's the prince of the power of the air. So he doesn't want that. But anyway, in different cultures of the world, people act and, and, and live in different ways. This is an Eastern culture. It's an Eastern culture. Uh, they, they don't do things like us here in the West. Do you notice the Bible refers to the church as a family? You ever notice that? In their culture, family was livelihood. You could not go off and break away from your family. And, and you, if you were to do that, it would be suicide. They were so dependent upon one another. Not like here. And in our culture, someone could be, I don't know, 15, 16 years old, get upset at their parents, break away from their parents, Go on to school, be successful, and live a ha happily ever after. Not so in this culture. If you broke ties with your family, it was suicide. Do you remember what Jesus, when He was on the cross, what did He look down at John and say? He said, Behold thy mother. You know why? She wouldn't have been able to survive without John. It was so different. So we must realize that as we're reading this. So this young man goes to his father, looks at him and says, I want my inheritance. While he's still living. That's not typically what happens. In that culture, if you were to say that to someone, you know what that's saying? You're dead to me. You're dead to me. Give me my inheritance. You're dead to me. That further evidence of that is what's he do right after he receives the money? He moves away to a faraway country. There's obviously no relationship between this son and this father. No relationship. So we see that. That's, that's something I wanted to point out. So he takes his inheritance, he goes off to a faraway country, and it says that he starts to blow it, he starts to spend it. And it gets to a point, it says in the Scriptures, there was a famine. There was a famine. Now this famine occurs... He loses all his money, then where does he end up working? With the pigs. Let me remind you, there in the Old Testament, there are different types of laws. Civil law, ceremonial law, and moral law. We are no longer under the civil and ceremonial laws because those are laws to the Jews. We are still under moral law, which would be like the Ten Commandments. But there were dietary laws, for example. You're not supposed to. I've heard people today, uh, I've, I've got a good friend, his, his mamaw, her name's Odell. She can hit a spittoon from across the room. And she was telling us one day, she's country as I'll get out. Her sister's name's Verdell. Odell and Verdell. And they live in the mountains. And they're, they're just good old country folks. And anyway, Odell one day was saying, we don't eat bacon. I was like, why don't you eat bacon? Boy, you're missing out. It's okay to laugh, amen? It's okay to laugh. Anyway, Odell said, well, it says in the Bible you can't eat pork. And I said, well, Odell, we're, we're not Jews. That's a civil and ceremonial law. If you go and you read the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch or the Torah, there are a lot of dietary laws. There are a lot of laws because God wanted His people to be set apart. Amen. But then one of the greatest verses of all, this is so relevant to today, in Acts chapter 10, Peter was talking with God about these dietary laws and God said, Peter, kill and eat. Amen? Yeah. 
That's a good verse for us today. Kill and eat. You can also read in Romans 14, listen, those civil ceremonial laws, they were abolished. We're no longer under those. Thank goodness. I love my bacon and I love my barbecue. So that has occurred. And he's moved away and it's, that's, where he's, that's where he's working. He's working amongst these pigs. And again, they were a filthy, filthy animal to the Jews. Now look back in your text with me if you would. Look at uh, verse 17. It says, And when he came to himself, if you were to go back to verse 16, he's amongst the pigs. But then in verse 17, And when he came to himself, you see, I believe very, the Bible refers to us as sheep. Right? Amen? Let me sit, nod your head if you're with me this morning. Nod your head. It refers to us as sheep. Sheep. I was an FFA in high school. My senior year, as before they had blocks, I had four hours of ag mechanics at William Blount High School. I loved ag mechanics. I was in Future Farmers of America. I'd speak at the farmers' meetings. But I've never been, listen, I've never owned a farm, but I know one thing about farming. You're not going to roll by a pig farm and see sheep in there rolling around in the mud. You're just not going to see it. And you know what? Within our Scripture, you know what that represents? It represents sin. We are, listen, we're not under those civil and ceremonial laws anymore, but we're still a set-apart people. God has still set us apart. Even though we have the liberty and freedom to eat those foods that the Jews were not at that point in time, He still expects things of us. He expects more of us. We are set apart. We are distinct. Amen? Amen. We are distinct. Remember that. So when we read this now, we read this, verse 17, he's in that position. It says, and he came to himself. I pray today that someone under, through this message, comes to himself or herself. And you realize you're lost, you're undone, you're in need of a Savior. Let's read on here. Let's, let's continue to read on. So he came to himself. He says, I'll arise, go to my father, verse 18. And he says in verse 19, I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. Now look at verse 20. It says, and he arose. So he took action. He took action. Some of you in here today, you need to take action. You're living in sin and you continue to live in that filth. You need to rise up this morning. You need to take action. You need to arise. Came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. You know, I grew up, my dad's 83 years old. He's old school. Grew up, had two pair of overalls. He told me one time he remembered having a house with a dirt floor. And when I grew up, my dad used the hickory tea on me. Y'all know what the hickory tea is, amen? Yeah, amen? Some of the youth in here, if you don't know what the hickory tea is, ask your parents. If they don't know what it is, ask the grandparents. They'll know what it is. But my dad used the hickory tea, and I remember there'd be times I would do things at school. I'd get in trouble. I knew the principal had called my dad. So my dad and him were friends. That was my luck. They grew up together. Gabe's got another fight in school. And I'd be on the bus this whole time, twiddling my thumbs. I didn't, listen, I got paddled at school a lot in elementary school, but that didn't compare to the, the whippings my dad had given me. Fortunately, he didn't give me, give me too many because I knew if I messed up and he gave me one, it was going to hurt. But I'd be on that bus and they'd drive me off the end of the street and I had about a three quarters of a mile walk to my house. And I'd walk it. And I'd be like, oh my goodness, what's... What's dad going to do? What's he going to think? What's he going to say? Now in our story, by the way, it's not in our biblical account rather, he's coming home and it says that his father ran him, hugged his neck. And my father would run up to me with a switch in his hand. <laughs> but he runs up to him. Can you imagine the thoughts that's going through his head on this long journey home? What's my father going to think? What's he going to say? What's he going to do? He comes in, he's walking through these areas. 
Remember, he just came out of a pigsty. He stinks. He's walking around other Jews. He smells like a pig. What's my father going to think? And he, I can just, just picture this. Just imagine we're, we see this scene and we see this man kind of coming over the, the, the edge of the horizon. And that father's been there watching and waiting for his son. And he recognizes him. And he runs to him. And it says that he hugs his neck and kisses his son. What a picture. And had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And then verse 21, And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against, the, against heaven and in thy sight, and, in, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him. Now there's three gifts that he gives. Three gifts. I'm going to go through them one by one. Because each one of these are important to understand. The first gift that he receives is a robe. Remember, let's, 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 let's go back. Let's rewind for a second. He left his father, looked at him, said, I want my inheritance. You're dead to me. Moves to a faraway land. Blows his inheritance. Ends up in a pigsty. His senses come to him, spiritually speaking. He starts on this trip. He gets to the horizon. His father sees him. He smells like pigs. He's filthy. And his father runs up, hugs him, kisses him, and says, bring the robe. You know what that is? That's the robe of righteousness. I remember. Uh, I, hey, listen, I'm fired up. I'm not going to use the steps. I remember at Fridsville First Baptist, when I was in the back row, and I was lost and undone. I thought I was a believer. I was these Pharisees. I thought I was getting heaven based on my righteousness. And I'm sitting there, and I come face to face <clears throat> with a holy and righteous God. And I recognize my lost condition. I recognize my lost state. And I got up and I went to that altar, and I grabbed, I went, my, my pastor would have been sitting about right here. And I leaned down and I said, Brother Mark, I'm lost. Mark Grubb. I'm, I think I saw his niece in here earlier, somewhere in here, but I was lost and undone. And we got to that altar and we prayed and I, for the first time, opened my eyes and I was a miracle. And I know that's happened here. And that's what this parable's talking about. He had, he had come. I, I, before I got up out of my seat, I was filthy. I was dirty in my sin. But I got up. And Jesus met me at the altar and He wrapped that robe of righteousness around me. And that's what happens here in our text. But the Father said to his servant, bring forth the best robe and put it on Him. Not only that, He's not done yet. Amen. He's not done yet. You're saying, wow, that's great. Amen. Praise God. He's not done. He's not done. The next thing it says, look here, and put a ring on His hand. You know what that ring represents? It means He was distinguished. It means that he was set apart. There's something different. Hey, he wears this ring. He belongs to God Almighty. It's, it's just amazing. And then look, look at the last, last thing. And shoes on his feet. Now here's something. We talked about culture. We talked about how different people in different parts of the world are different. Uh, it's the same thing here. You probably wouldn't think about anybody, especially us being East Tennessee hillbillies, someone running around barefoot, right? But in this context, if someone's walking around barefoot, you know what that means? It means they're a slave. Bare slaves ran around barefoot in ancient Palestine. So when he places those slippers upon his feet... What he's saying is this. He's saying, listen, you are no longer a slave. Now let's connect that parable to what God means by it. You are no longer a slave to sin. That day I walked down the aisle, rather ran down the aisle, grabbed, tackled my pastor because I knew I was lost and undone. Same thing happened. I got wrapped with the robe of righteousness. A, a spiritually speaking, a ring, a ring was put on my finger 
And He put those slippers upon me because I was no longer a slave to sin. Doesn't mean I don't sin at times. We all do. But we don't practice it. We don't embrace it. Those are not things that we rejoice in. When you sin and I sin, we have... Listen, there's been a new owner that's moved into this temple. It used to be Satan. And Satan did whatever he could to destroy this temple. Some of you in here maybe have had renters... And they destroyed your place. Jesus came in and He remodeled it. <laughs> he went into the closets and He pulled out all the... He did whatever He wanted to do because He owns it. But unfortunately, there are times that I still sin against Him. But I'm no longer a slave and neither was this man in our parable. Look at verse 23. <clears throat> and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat, and be merry. For this my son was dead. Do you notice that? And is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Now his elder son was in the field. And as he came and drew nigh to the house, he had heard music and dancing. Before we talk about this other son, when we look at our text here, Guess what happened when this son was found? There was a celebration. Amen. And when someone gets saved, when they fall on their face and they do it in humility and they humble themselves and they recognize, I'm lost. I'm in need of a Savior. Oh, there's glory. There's, there's rejoicing going on in heaven. And I would love to see rejoicing going on in here for a lost sinner to come home. Verse 25, Now his elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, Neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment, and yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might be, make merry with my friends. Verse 30, But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. Now, here's the scenario. All this celebration's going on for this lost son. Now, here comes the other brother. He comes up over the horizon. He hears all this stuff. He sees all this stuff. What's he do? He questions. He's murmuring. Yeah, murmuring. Now, now, let's go back to the first three verses. Do you remember what happened in the first three verses? Jesus is hanging out with sinners. Yeah. And here comes these Pharisees, these self-righteous Pharisees. And they see what's going on. And they start mummering. And they start complaining. And Jesus shares three parables. He shares these parables. So here's what I'm trying to say to you this morning. This brother that comes in right here in this text that's complaining, he represents the Pharisees. The other brother who comes home represents these sinners in chapter 15, 1 through 3. Amen. Study it for yourself. Read it for yourself when you get home. There's a reason Jesus starts sharing these three parables. And I love the parable of the lost sheep. That's, that, <clears throat> I don't have time here today, but uh, let, me, let me just real quick share with you <clears throat> about that parable. I remember as a kid thinking, okay, why would Jesus, or why would a shepherd... Why would he leave 99 sheep unattended and go after one? You ever wonder that? I mean, I understand. I'm thankful that he cares enough about one person to do that. But if you study the Jewish manners and customs, <clears throat> and I apologize, I'm about to lose my voice. That may be the biggest amen I get this morning. But here's the thing I want to point out to you. In this culture, when people in villages would have, a typical family would have about eight or ten sheep. 
And what they would do many times is they would pull all their sheep together and they would hire two or three shepherds to watch the whole flock. People they knew from within the community, people they could trust. So when there is a sheep that gets separated, all right, you do have a shepherd go looking for them, but these other sheep are not unattended. We still listen because that would be chaos if we didn't have a shepherd watching over the rest of us. Because you know what sheep are? They're dumb animals. That's what the Bible calls us. We're a bunch of dumb animals. But let's go back to our text as we get ready to kind of come to a close here. Verse 31, And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad for this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found listen as we get ready to close I told you based off what I see in this text and you may disagree with me and that's fine it's not like we're disagreeing on Jesus being the only way to heaven. If we disagreed on something like that, that would be a major problem. So if you do believe this is still referring to a backslidden Christian, that that's, again, back it up with Scripture. I told you from Scripture why I think it's referring to a lost person. So you came in here today possibly thinking that this parable was talking about a backslidden Christian. And maybe through the message today you have been convinced that is referring to someone who was lost and, and God draws and He comes to His senses and He gets saved. Amen. There may be someone in here today. Listen to me right here. Listen up before we get ready to close. Because I know we're getting ready to go. We're going to fellowship. We're going to eat. It's going to be good. But that's just meeting your temporary needs. Right. We're talking about something here that meets your eternal needs. The Bible says, knowing, therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. And I'm going to do what I can and what I say to convince you. If you're going to go to hell, I pray that you're going to go around, you're going to have to go around my dead body. You're going to have to walk around me to get there. I hope I'm in front of you putting on the full court press with this text. Because it's so important. Where you're going to eat next doesn't matter. What you're going to do this week, it doesn't matter. Because your football team played horrible yesterday, it doesn't matter. What matters in light of eternity is do you know Him? Let me me share a quick story with you. And I I really am about to completely lose my voice. I was in a... I was in a rest Gracie's. Brother Charles, you and I ate there not too long ago for lunch. I was in Gracie's one day, and I was walking out. And I was with another friend of mine, and the mayor was there. And I looked at the mayor, and I waved at him and said, Hey, how you doing? And he said, Hey, how are you doing, uh, Mr. Mitchell? And anyway, the person I was with didn't live around here. He didn't know who he was. He said, Who is that? And I said, that's the mayor. He said, oh, does he know you? I said, no, I know who he is, but he doesn't know me. Mm-hmm. See, there's people, I believe, in a, in the, in a room with this many people. I, w- I would imagine there's people in here who knows who Jesus is, yeah. but he doesn't know you. That's right. Amen. Amen. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you this morning, Two questions. Do you know Him? And does He know you? Is there a real relationship? Do the things of God matter? Listen, we talked a moment ago about all these other things that get in our way. I'm ne- Brother Charles, I know he's been there and done this. I've been by a lot of people's deathbeds in the ministry. It's not something I look forward to, but it's something you deal with. I've never had one of them look at me and say, Hey, let's talk about football. Hey, let's talk about my new antique car. Let's talk about golf. Unfortunately, it takes people to get in a position like that 
where now they're starting to talk about, well, what's going to happen when I die? And let me tell you something else real quick. And I know we've talked about this before, Brother Charles. Nowadays, they get you so doped up on drugs, there's not near as many deathbed conversions as there used to be. I, I was asked a few years ago, please go talk to my dad. He's dying. He's under hospice care. I go over there. He's, a, he's on deep space nine. He doesn't know what world he's in. I started to try to talk to him. He looked at me and fell right back to sleep. He died a few days later. According to his own testimony, a lost man. So are you gonna are you gonna take the chances on waiting till you're on your deathbed? Do you know I think Satan would love to have the nurses to fill you up with drugs so you are non-responsive? Wake up! Recognize what the text says. You're in a pigsty right now. It's time to get out of it and come home. Hey, you want to talk about a homecoming celebration? We can have one right here, right now. If you would bow your head, close your eyes. Brother Earl comes forward is going to have us a song ready. Listen, you don't have to wait for me to get finished praying. You can come right now to this old-fashioned altar. You can get on your face like I did and many others in here have. And you can call out to Jesus. You can call upon His name. And He can change you forever. If that be you this morning, come on, right now, don't wait. Come. That's why we're here. Maybe you're here today. You've, uh, you have trusted in Jesus, but you're off the path of righteousness. You're not living for Him the way you should. The things of God don't excite you. You're apathetic. You're going through the motions. You're, the only reason you're here today is because it's homecoming. There's people that they're only at church on Sundays because it's Sunday at 10 o'clock. Huh. Whatever the need may be, whatever God may be calling you to do, do it now. Do it now. Do it now. Father, Lord, we thank You. We praise You. We lift You up. Lord, I pray, Lord, if there's someone in here who doesn't know You, Lord, save them for it's everlasting too late. Yes. I don't have much of a voice, but Lord, the little voice I have left, I, very, I believe You're wanting me to use it to try to cry out one more time to someone who needs You. Please, Lord, save that sinner. Draw that person out of the pig pen of sin. And allow them to come forward so you can place that robe of righteousness around them. Lord, that you can put that ring upon their finger and those slippers upon their feet because they are no longer slaves to Satan and to sin. Help us now, Lord. Use this time. And it's in your Son's holy and precious name we do pray. Amen. If everybody would stand as we sing a song of invitation. 321. Page 321. Now, come. Come on. Careless soul, why will you linger wandering from the fold of God? Hear ye not the invitation? Oh, prepare to meet thy God. Careless soul, oh, heed the for oh, your life will soon be gone. Oh, how sad to face the judgment, unprepared to meet thy God. Hey, we're going to sing another verse, another couple of verses, Lord willing. But you all know when Christians lie the most, when we're singing these hymns. You ever think about that? Where He leads me, I will go. There's people in here right now. I don't know you. I don't know hardly anybody in here. I just know how people are. 
I've been in the ministry long enough to know people. And I've been guilty of this. There's people in here right now. You've not prayed any this week. You've not cracked your Bible this week. You've not shared the gospel this week. Yet you sing these songs like you've done those things. I, I'm talking to myself as much as anybody else in here. I'm just saying this. As a pastor, I am more concerned with people who never come to the altar than people who never do. I'd rather see you up here every Sunday than never be up here. Again, you can do what God's leading you to do. I'm not going to stop Earl again unless the Lord prompts me. But I'm going to let we're going to sing our verse here. And do as God would have you to do, as Brother leads us, Brother Earl. Why so thoughtless are you standing while the fleeting years go by? And your life is spent in folly, hope we bear to meet thy God. Careless souls, oh heed the warning for oh, your life. Judgment, 